Hello, hello, and welcome in. My name is Nick. I'm the host and founder of Part-Time Pilot. Thank you for listening to the Audio Ground School podcast. This is the podcast where we go through the Part-Time Pilot online ground school for Private Pilot, every single lesson free in audio format for you guys. Today is a great episode for a change. (laughs) Today we're going to continue on the section on navigation. So that's section 16 in the online ground school. If you're following along in the online ground school, which again, I always highly recommend that you do because you can get all the visuals and quizzes and videos and stuff like that. But you're going to go into your step one course, the step one private pilot online ground school course. That's where all the lessons, videos, quizzes, all that stuff is, even these audio lessons. So you'll go in there and then go to section 16 of that course on navigation. Last couple episodes, we did a deep dive on the aeronautical charts. That was lesson one. And then this episode, we're going to do pilotage and dead reckoning. So that's a short lesson, just kind of some definitions of what that is and why it's important. And then we're going to get into VORs, DMEs, TACANs, and VORTACs. So that's all about ground-based navigation. And that's a big lesson. You know, it's one of the toughest, most asked about topics by student pilots is VOR navigation. We're going to also cover that in two episodes. So we're going to do kind of what is a VOR, what is ground-based navigation, what instruments do you use, how do you set up your instruments to use that. And then in the part two, we'll give examples and try our best to explain how to use them and how to find your position or track a VOR radio or intercept a radio and actually navigate with these things. So that's what we're going to do. Before we get to that, we have a couple announcements. One, we have been doing live lessons. So we did a series of four live lessons. I try to do them every every three months or so, you know, maybe something pops up. And it had been a while since I'd done lessons on particular subjects. So I just asked you guys, you know, what subjects do you want the most? And I took the most four, you know, mentioned subjects. The last four Wednesdays, we've been doing live lessons free for everybody that wants to sign up. You just got to sign up for the Zoom link. We'll put that in show notes because we do have one more of those. We've done three of them already. And the fourth one is this Wednesday at 4 p.m. So depends on when you're listening to this, but I believe this episode is dropping Monday. Let's see. It rolls over into February, so I'm not good with days of months. February the 5th. So that's when this episode drops. So if you listen to this on the 5th or the 6th or even the 7th before 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, you still have a chance to join us. Check out the link in our show notes. Sign up for that Zoom link, and we'll send you a Zoom link as long as you you know, sign up before like Wednesday at noon, we'll send you that link and come join us. If you miss it, you want the replay of it. Those will be placed inside your online ground school bonus course. So members of our online ground school, we have a bonus course where we have all our recorded live lessons and other bonus videos in there. We also have all our bonus downloads like flashcards or ultimate private pilot test prep, PDF, what else? Study guides, cross country planning guides, all that stuff. So That's where it'll be if you miss it, but you should come and join us for this last one, which we're going to cover, incidentally, VORs. So if you want that visual of the VORs, then come and join us. All right, so that's one announcement I had. The other one is just kind of a personal thing. We're going to release an IFR ground school. It's been in the works for a long time. I've been working really hard. I If you guys are in my private pilot ground school, you know that I don't leave any stone unturned, and it's very comprehensive. And so I did the same thing with IFR, and when I got my private pilot's license about, gosh, six, seven years ago now, afterwards I took an IFR ground school myself online, so I I learned it then, but I never ended up continuing on to the flying part. So I had that base knowledge there, and then and had to learn it again to a level even higher, and that's a good study technique, is you should always try and learn something as if you have to explain it and teach it right? Because with that new perspective of me teaching it to you guys, I had to learn every nook and cranny good enough to be able to explain in simple English, right? Just like I do our private pilot course. So I've been doing that over the last year. And to make it official, I went and took the FAA test to become an instrument ground instructor. And I did that today and I passed with a 92. I was hoping for a 100% because I really knew my stuff. But as always, the FAA throws some uh, unexpected curves at you with some weirdly worded questions and a couple I, I hadn't seen before. So I struggled with a couple and maybe made a stupid mistake, I think. Maybe. I'm not sure. 
But anyways, 92 is pretty good. I'll take it. So that's just a personal thing. But on top of that, uh, our IFR course should be, gosh, I want to say like a week after this drops, we'll be start talking about uh, releasing the beta version of that. So if you want to jump in on the beta where you can get a smoking deal for lifetime access in exchange for, you know, understanding that it's not a complete 100% finished product, I'll be still adding some audio lessons and video lessons and stuff like that. That's something you want to look out for and follow us on social media and the podcast and email. You can sign up for our emails as well. Okay, so enough of those announcements. Before we, let's get back into the flow of how we usually do these episodes, right? So if you've been with us before, you know, we like to read off a couple reviews and then maybe take a question from our Facebook study group. And if you want to join us there, you can. It's a great resource. Uh, just search part-time pilot private pilot study group in Facebook. So let's read off a couple reviews. First one is from Vivian to five stars. Easy to understand. The material is well laid out and easy to understand. I love the variety in study aids. So that's from Vivian. Shout out to Vivian. Thank you so much for the review. The next one is from Cade Welsh. Cade says five star review, part-time pilot accessible ground training. Part-time pilot is an excellent source of information with many different approaches to help assimilate what you're learning. So two couple short and sweet uh, reviews, and I really appreciate it, Kate. Thank you. And then one more. Demetrios says, five stars. PTP is great, affordable, and technically sound. Part-time pilot has allowed me to be financially smart about my aviation training and be as safe of a pilot as I can be. Love that. Thank you, Demetrios, and thank you, Kate, and thank you, Vivian. We have some more, but we'll save those for the next episode. All right. So for our question today, I actually want to bring up and talk about a couple of questions that were brought up in our last live lesson. So it was actually our second of the four live lessons. There was a few questions that stumped me. Some really good questions on the live lessons. And I, on there, you know, I gave my best two cents about them, but then I said, let me follow up. And I made a couple short videos on our Instagram after I did some digging and found the answers for you guys. And, you know, I never try and act like I know everything. And I don't think anybody should. I think anyone that does try and act like they know everything is usually hiding something. At least that's my philosophy. But if I don't know it, I'm going to find it for you guys. And so that's that's what we did. And I just want to talk about them here. So the first one was when we are calculating a ground speed and wind correction angle using our E6B. The reason we do the wind correction angle, right, is because if we don't apply a wind correction angle, then the track over our ground, let's say we have a crosswind, right? And we don't apply a wind correction angle, then we won't get the track across the ground. Our ground track won't be what we want because the wind is going to push us off our ground track, right? Now, if we apply our wind correction angle, we will kind of fly crab into the wind, so to speak, and we'll fight the wind so that we go on the ground track that we want. So the question was, wouldn't turning into the wind slow our ground speed? So we calculate on the E6B, our ground speed and wind correction angle. And so if we fly straight uh, with a crosswind, that crosswind is really not going to affect our ground speed. But if we turn into the crosswind, right, now it has a little bit of a headwind component, won't that slow down our ground speed? And the answer is yes, it would. But when we do it, when we calculate it on the wind side of our E6B, it incorporates that already into the answer. So the ground speed you get is assuming that you're flying at the wind corrected angle. So it assumes that you've already put the wind correction angle and that's going to be your ground speed. The particular example we did on the live lesson didn't do a great job of showing that. It was almost a direct crosswind, but not quite. And then we crabbed, we had a pretty big wind correction angle. And when we crabbed into it, it didn't change our ground speed from our true airspeed. It only changed it by like one knot. So it looked like it barely didn't even change it, change it at all. Uh, but in truth, in reality, it, it will have a little bit of an effect. But just after we applied like that 12 degrees of wind correction angle, it gave us 12 degrees more of a headwind component. And so it dropped us probably like one knot of ground speed. So anyways, that was a great question. Hopefully you guys understand what I'm talking about. The next question was, oh yeah, someone was asking if they can convert like statute miles and nautical miles on their E6B. And I thought that you couldn't. And this is, we're talking about the paper E6B. I didn't know you could. So I said, no, I don't think so. But I even admitted, I was like, 
but there's so much information on this little thing that I could be wrong. And then someone piped up and said, yeah, you actually, you can. You look at, if you look around on, and this is on the, the side, you know, the slider side with the rate equations, the wheel side, right? And you look around the wheel on the scales, you'll see a, a little like double arrow. One arrow points to SM for statue miles and one points to nautical miles. And you basically just put, let's say you want to go from statue miles to nautical miles. You just put the SM over the statue miles and then you read off the nautical miles under the arrow for this that has NM by it. And that's it. So it's just really small in there. So I never even saw it or paid attention to it. So that was really cool. And same goes for knots airspeed, which is nautical miles per hour. And like miles per hour, we think of a car, which is statue miles per hour. So you can do the same thing. Just, you you know, line up the NM or the SM on whatever, you know, either miles per hour or knots, and then you convert between the two. So that was really cool. So great question there as well. And then the last question was, we were talking about how in most of the speeds we fly in a single propeller aircraft that the indicated airspeed is the same as the calibrated airspeed. It's only maybe a knot or two difference at most. So why don't aircraft just show you the calibrated airspeed? Like if there's just a chart that says, you know, because the difference is between indicated and calibrated airspeed, it's the errors in the system from like when you turn and the pedal probe doesn't get all the air into the tube because it's when you're at an angle. So it's airs like that and stuff. And so the question was a great question. It was like, well, why doesn't your airspeed indicator just apply the airs that it has and show you calibrated airspeed? And the answer is because it's hard. It's harder, right? So what the airs, most of the airs are, right? When you're flying straight into the relative air, it goes right into the pedal probe. But if you crab or you turn or yaw or whatever, such that the air is not going straight into that hole, you get an air, right? The air is still going over the wings and it's going over the aircraft, fine, but it's not going into that pedo hole 100%. So you're going to get some air in your instrumentation. So it depends on a lot of things, right? It depends on the dynamics of the aircraft, the angle of attack, the angle of yaw, the angle of pitch, all that stuff. So in most older aircraft where they just have these analog instruments that, you know, for airspeed, they don't have these computer systems, it's kind of hard. But the ones that do have computer systems, they actually can do that. And not all of them do, but some of them do tell you your calibrated airspeed. But why would you want to know calibrated airspeed? Why not, if you have a computer, why not just go the next step and show you the true airspeed? And so that's what most of these electronically advanced aircraft you know, where these, they have these computer systems and PDF displays, they usually show you true airspeed and they also show you ground speed and indicated airspeed. So they just kind of pass over calibrated airspeed. They make those calculations, but that's no use for you. You as a pilot, you want to see indicated airspeed because that's what your aircraft, that's what you make decisions off your aircraft and on what to target in terms of indicated airspeed. And then for planning and purposes, you want to use true airspeed And ground speed, true airspeed is your actual speed through the air, taking into the qualities of the air, the density of the air. And then ground speed is, of course, your speed over the ground. So calibrated airspeed doesn't really have a use other than to get you to true airspeed. So that's usually why they don't show it. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So I've been babbling on for 16 minutes now. Uh, Hopefully you guys found all of that interesting. But let's now finally get into our lesson on pilotage and dead reckoning. Are you struggling on your radio calls to ATC? Are you looking for a better way to practice that's not up there in the air in that stressful situation? Well, I want to talk to you guys about something called AR Sim or Aviation Radio Simulator by Plain English. It lets you practice talking to ATC through all phases of VFR and IFR flight from taxi out to takeoff all at your own pace. There's no simulator setup needed. And it works on any device, mobile or the web. So whether you're a novice or seasoned pro, the guided communication curriculum in trainer mode will elevate your comms proficiency greatly. Download ARSM by Plain English today and check out our show notes where you can get 10% off using a coupon code. It is a great tool and I highly, highly recommend it. So again, we're in 
Step one course, the step one private pilot online ground school course, section 16 on navigation, lesson two, pilotage and dead reckoning. Pilotage is defined as navigation by reference to landmarks or checkpoints. Dead reckoning comes from the dead, D-E-D, or deduced reckoning, and is defined as navigation solely by means of computations of time, airspeed, distance, and direction. Think about that for a sec. Navigation solely by means of time, airspeed, distance, and direction. That's pretty crazy, right? But it can be done if you do it accurately and you know keep track of it along your flight. And that's kind of like pilots used to do this all the time. Like that's how they used to navigate. They didn't have you know GPS and they didn't even have like other ground-based navigation. So you would literally use pilotage and dead reckoning. You know that goes back to ships exploring the world and mapping out the world for the first time. So really, really cool stuff. And this is what you calculated in your cross-country planner when we did went through the cross-country planning section. If you were 100% accurate in these calculations, you would be able to fly solely by your instruments, a watch, and your cross-country planner. Again, pretty wild to think about. If you have gone through the cross-country planning section of you know this course, then you have already learned how to calculate what you need for dead dead reckoning, excuse me. Pilotage should be used in addition to dead reckoning in order to add more data points to your route. So again, pilotage is defined as navigation by reference to landmarks and checkpoints. So when you combine the two, you know, in VFR flight where we can see these landmarks and checkpoints, that's when you can really get something when you combine the two. This way, you are giving yourself more chances to verify your location, your speed, your time and route, and your fuel burn. All good things for keeping you safe and not lost on your cross-country flight. Notes for pilotage can be put in the notes section of your cross-country planner. For example, if I made a checkpoint at the point where I reached the northern end of a lake, but I expect the lake be to the left of my route of flight, I might place a note that says northern end of Lake X. Let's say it's Lake Elsinore. That's in Southern California. So northern end of Lake Elsinore, two nautical miles off to left. Okay. That is a typical note that I would put in my cross-country flight plans. So I, I'm specific. I'm saying if I am on course, right, the lake's going to be about two nautical miles to my left. And at this time, I should hit the north part of that lake. I should pass over the north part of that lake. So that way, that gives me a lot of information just in that one note, right? If I am end up flying over the lake, I know that my magnetic heading are wrong because the wind has changed. So I have drifted to the left, and I need, if I'm continuing in that direction, I need to make some corrections to the right in my magnetic heading. And then if I get to the north part of the lake earlier than I thought, right, then I'm flying quicker. I'm making, I have more, a better ground speed perhaps. Or if I get there slower, and you know, I have a slower ground speed. And if it, if I get there way slower, you know, considerably slower, then I start to think of, okay, well, how much extra fuel have I burned? You know, because if I, it was already tight on how much fuel I have, and I, you know, it's going to be real close if I have enough fuel with my reserves or anything, and then I get to the north end of the lake, and I'm five minutes behind, that means I'm flying an extra five minutes, so there's going to be an extra five minutes of fuel burn, so it starts to add up. So those are all in that one sentence, uh, ascertain quite a bit of information that can help you. And when you do that each checkpoint, that's basically what they did, you know, back in the day before Fort Flight and all these other other tools. And this, I believe, makes you a better pilot when you learn this, because if any of that stuff fails, you have this as a backup. And even even not as a backup, you know, knowing these things at each checkpoint can make you make these corrections quicker. And any advantage you can have as a pilot could be the thing that that saves your life. So uh, let's continue on here. A checkpoint used for pilotage should be prominent and easy to see at most altitudes. Obviously, we're flying in VFR here. Here are some other things that can be used as visual markers other than a lake for good pilotage. Roads and road intersections, so major highways, right, are really good. You could cross over a highway or you can follow along a highway. Maybe there's a highway intersection, you know, two big highway intersections is a good visual point. Rivers. Railroads are really good, right? They 
there's trees and stuff that it's a clearing in the trees in a straight line you can see the railroads and they're they're marked on your sec and all these things are marked on your sectional charts as well so you can check your sectional chart and make sure it matches with what you're seeing outside uh things like the tallest peaks or standalone you know mountains right those will be on your sectional chart easy to spot and they'll also the tallest peak is easy to spot from in the air uh lakes we said power lines are those are on sectional charts windmills solar farms sand dunes peninsulas large parks baseball soccer or football fields large warehouses uh water towers and then also right like airports heliports you know maybe other bodies of water like reservoirs or treatment plants things like that uh what else i think that's a i think that's a pretty good list for now so you guys get the hint and that is it that's our lesson on pilotage and dead reckoning not too many things you might be quizzed on here but it's good to understand what exactly it is and how it can help you in your flight lessons all right let's move on to lesson three of section 16 and that is vors dmes tacans and vortex so we're going to split this up into two because it's a doozy uh, like i said it's one of the more confusing concepts for student pilots to understand is how to use a vor so we're going to separate it into the basics of ground-based navigation systems you know how to find the information on a chart what they do you know all that jazz and then we're going to uh do next week's episode will be all about how to use them how to find your position how to find your relative position you know from a vor station how to find your exact position uh, with a vor or two vors and a dme and then how to like track radials intercept radials all that stuff and we'll do examples so uh let's get into the lesson on vors dmes tacans and vortex in the absence of a good checkpoint or an event where visibility becomes low you are not allowed as an a vfr private pilot to fly with low visibility but you should still plan for the scenario you will need to know how to navigate with your instruments so i would also add to that that without gps or for flight right you're going to need to know how to use a vor and once you get it into ifr you're definitely going to need to know how to use vor to travel on routes and all that stuff but even on vfr you know it can help identify checkpoints vors can if you get lost it can tell you where you vrs can tell you where you are it can tell you distance you know dmes can tell you distances from stations two vrs can tell you where you are you can track radials to use routes specific routes vfr routes stuff like that so very 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 helpful tool and i know that you know hey why can't we just use gps well your examiner is probably going to see and make sure you know how to use VORs at some point in your check ride. All right, so VORs, DMEs, uh, or VOR slash DMEs, TACANs, and Vortex are the common navigation and radar systems that should be understood by any pilot. So you can have a station, a ground-based navigation station that has VOR capabilities, and then you can have one that has DME capabilities. Or you can have one that has both VOR and DME. That's probably the most common. Or you can have what's called a TACAN. Or you can have what's called a VORTAC. And we'll get into each of these. Again, most student pilots will work with VORs, DMEs, or VOR slash DMEs. Also, I would say VORTAC as well. But okay, what is a VOR? VOR stands for VHF Omnidirectional Range or Very High Frequency. That's what VHF stands for. So it's an acronym in an acronym within an acronym, like an acronym inception. Um, gotta love aviation, right? Uh, so very high frequency omnidirectional range. It is a navigation beacon intended for civil use and provides pilots with a radial or beacon to and from the VOR station. VORs work on frequencies between 108.00 and 117.95 megahertz. VORs are used to determine your aircraft's position with respect to a VOR station but they do not tell you how close or far away your aircraft is from a station, only the direction from it. So it might say you're, you know, tell you you're northeast from the station. It's not going to tell you exactly where you are. That would need a distance. So that's where we get into DMEs. 
So we'll talk about that in a second. Multiple VOR stations can be used to triangulate an exact position and distance from a location. And we'll, again, in the next episode, we'll tell you exactly how you can do that. Okay, so what is a DME? Well, DME stands for Distance Measurement Equipment, similar to a VOR radio or beacon, but provides the distance from the station. Then you have a VOR slash DME station, so it has both. VOR DME is a combination of, you guessed it, VOR and DME, on frequencies between 108.00 and 117.95. A VOR slash DME provides a radio or beacon to and from the VOR station along with the distance to that station. Uh, these can be used to find exact locations of your aircraft, direction, and distance from a known point, and the VOR DME station. So you know where the VOR DME station is. Uh, your VOR part of that, you know, the VOR instrument in your aircraft tells you which radio or which direction from that station you are. So again, let's say it says you're northwest from that station. And then the DME tells you how far away. So if you know the exact what's called radial, so let's say northwest, it's, uh, let's say it's 335 degrees. So that, you know, a heading of 335 degrees is to the northwest. So 335 degrees, let's say that's the radial you're on, and you're 20 nautical miles from the station, you can literally draw the 335 direction from that station. You can draw a line on that. That's called a radial. So out from the middle, the center of the station, out in the 335 direction, that's the 335 radial. You know your aircraft somewhere along that in the northwest direction. And then the DME tells you you're 20 nautical miles from the station. So you put a point on that 335 line, that's right where your aircraft is. So the combination of knowing the radial you're on, direction around the station, and the distance tells you your exact location. If you didn't have the DME, only tell you the radial you're on, your, the general direction from the station, but not how far away on that radial you are, right? You need a DME or another VOR to triangulate that position. And again, we'll talk about that in the next episode. All right, so then we have a TACAN. A TACAN stands for tactical, so that's where the TAC comes from, tactical air navigation. It is a military system similar to a VOR, but with higher accuracy. TACANs work on frequencies between 960 and 1215 megahertz. So uh, the higher frequency band that the military uses included in the TACAN is a DME that may be used by civil aircraft. So the one thing you as a civil, you know, you're not in the military, so a civil, you know, pilot should remember about TACANs is you can use the DME information from a TACAN. All right, then you have a Vortec. Uh, Vortec is a combination of a VOR and a TACAN, meaning that the same station provides both. So it provides VOR to, uh, you know, civil aircraft, and then it provides TACAN to military aircraft, and then DME to both, right? Because TACAN provides DME to both. Civil users will use the VOR frequencies as well as the DME from the TACAN. This can be used to tell you your aircraft's exact position, uh, which is the direction from the station with VOR and distance from the TACAN, or DME. This makes a Vortec essentially a VOR DME for civil pilots, but with more accuracy and slightly slight differences in frequencies and operation. VORs, DMEs, VOR DMEs, TACANs, and Vortex can be used to determine where you are in relation to a station along the route of your flight. It is critical that a pilot know how to use these services for the purposes of this course. We will discuss how to use a VOR and DME with the knowledge that the TACANs and Vortex may be used the exact same way. They just reside on different frequencies. The below image, and I'll kind of explain what we're seeing here, shows a commonly used Vortex in Southern California, which is Oceanside Vortex. This can be distinguished on a sectional or terminal area chart by a circular dial or compass rose uh, that's in blue. So when you see, you know, these um, kind of like compass rose dials, right? These circles with all the, all the directions and notches listed on their directions, that's a VOR or a Vortec or a TACAN on your sectional charts, okay? And then you, you'll be able to look and see all the different radials, notches along that. And then it's going to have a, a VOR or Vortec. It's going to have an information box that tells you a bunch of things, and we'll get into that. And then right in the middle, right in the very middle of it, 
it's going to have the symbol uh, for where the exact station is. So in the middle of that dial, that compass rose, is the station. It's emanating out the signals directions for aircraft on any radio, but, and it's right in the middle, and that symbol changes depending on what it is, and uh, we'll talk about that here. So the circular dial tells you that this has directional information capabilities. But in order to determine whether it's a VOR, VOR DME, Vortec, or TACON, you'll have to look at the center point within the circle. And the, the following image, the next image here, uh, shows what each symbol means. And I'll try to explain here on the audio podcast what, what these symbols look like. Uh, but this is going to be, all these symbols are going to be in the legend on your sectional chart or terminal area chart. So if you look in the, you know, the sides where the legend is, you'll see these labeled and the symbols labeled so you can know. And when you see these circular dials, you can look in the middle at the middle station mark, uh, the symbol in the middle, and that tells you what it is. And once you know what it is, you know what type of capabilities it has, right? If it's just a VOR, it just tells you your general direction. If it's a VOR do you mean, then it tells you the distance as well. Stuff like that. Okay, so a VOR is just a one, two, three, four, five, six, a hexagon. <laughs> I was counting the sides. So it's a hexagon with a dot in it. And I think we covered these in the sectional chart symbols. So we may have already covered these, but I'm going to cover them again anyways. The VOR DME is that hexagon with a dot in the center and then a square around the hexagon. So it's a hexagon. It's a dot within a hexagon that's within a square. So that tells you the DME. So the DME symbol is just a square. The VOR symbol is the hexagon. So when you have them both, it's a VOR DME. If you just have a square, it's a DME. If you just have a hexagon, it's a VOR. A vortex is like a triangle with a dot in the center, but imagine cutting the tips off each point of the triangle and then bolding the lines where you cut the tips. So that's kind of what it looks like. Hopefully that makes sense. So you have a triangle, cut off just the tips of each point, and then the extra side that it made, the little sides that your cut made at the points, you make those thick, <laughs> right? You, you bold those lines. That's what a vortex looks like with a dot in the center. And then you have uh, some other uh, radio aids to navigation, like a an RCO, which is just a, a circle with a dot in it. Um, so that's like a remote outlet for FSS stations. And then you have like an NDB, which has, it's a circle with a dot in it, and it's usually magenta color. And that's got a bunch of concentric circles of dots. Um, but uh, we're not going to get into those. We'll just focus on the VORs, DMEs, and all that. The rectangular box inside the circle gives you the information so now we're talking about the dial, you know, the compass rose dial. There's going to be, it's either going to be inside that dial or somewhere close. It's going to be an informational box in blue that's going to tell you information about that navigation station. In the case of our, our example where we showed the Oceanside uh, Vortac, the civilian VOR transmits on frequency 115.3 and the TACAN for military personnel transmits on channel 100. So it says Oceanside in the middle, and then the next line, it says 115.3, so that's the VOR frequency. And then it says CH100, so that's channel 100. Anytime you see channel, you think that's for military. And then it says OCN, so that's the abbreviation, the abbreviation for the, the station is OCN. And then it has a bunch of dashes and dots, and this is the, the Morse code identifier for the station. So when you're flying along, you want to make sure, you want to, so what you would do, you would dial in 115.3 into your nav radio, and then you'd want to make sure that the VOR station is working correctly, right? And that it's on, and it's powered, and you're receiving signals from it. So what you could do is you pull out your knob, uh, your volume knob on your nav station, and listen for the Morse code. And if it matches what's in this box on your sectional chart, then you know, you, you, one, you have, it's working, the station's working, and two, you're dialed into the right station that you want. So Oceanside, it's dash, dash, dash. The next line is dash, dot, dash, dot. And then it goes dash, dot. So that would sound like beep, 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 beep. Right? That, the, hopefully that, that made sense. Uh, and then below, um, so let me see where I'm at. That got me all flustered doing those beeping sounds. Uh, so a pilot should 
do that what I just did, you know, check for the Morse code every time they change the dial to a different VOR to make sure that the data you're using from the station or that you think you're getting from the station is is accurate. Because sometimes the VOR will be out of service and no Morse code will play. Um, and that's also extremely helpful information. Uh, because sometimes when they're out of service, they can still emanate your VOR instrument can still show like it's picking up a radial, but it's actually not the correct radial because it's like, it's still picking up a, a signal from it, but it's not an accurate signal. So you want to know that for sure. Underneath the box, you're going to see the name. So in this example, it says, in kind of like uh, brackets, it says San Diego. Uh, this tells us this Vortac station is also a flight service station uh, for San Diego radio. And the number on the top of the box in this example says 122.1 R. This is the FSS frequency. And if it, it could have just the number or it could be a number plus an R. If it has an R, that indicates that this frequency is receive only. So that means that on that frequency, they can only receive. They cannot talk back. So you can, if you want to talk to the FSS station, you'll have to talk to them on the 122.1R, the one with the R on it. So you talk to them, they hear you on 122.R. They can receive on that, but they can't talk back on that. They talk back on the VOR frequency, which in this example is 115.3. So you'd have one radio dialed into 115.3 to listen to, okay? And then you'd have the other radio dialed in to 122.1, which they receive. So you transmit, you'd, you know, you'd key the mic and talk on 122.1. And then since you have both of them tuned up in your radios at the same time, you can hear them both, and you'll hear when they transmit back on 115.3. So also in this lesson, we have a diagram that shows you the whole kind of VOR system of instruments and stations, all, all of that kind of breaking down into one sort of diagram here. So I'm going to kind of explain everything that you see in this diagram for those of you following along in the online ground school. We also have a video that shows kind of what I was talking about before, you know, the, the communication box about the communication boxes and how to read them on a sectional chart. I'll put that in the show notes for you guys. And um, all right, so this figure here, it has an aircraft and the VOR antennas are usually on the vertical stabilizer and they're usually one on each side of the vertical stabilizer pointing ba aft, pointing backwards. And uh, those are the VOR antennas. There's usually two of them if you have two VOR uh, receivers and instruments inside your cockpit. And then you'll receive a signal from a VOR station into your VOR antennas. Uh, that signal goes from the antennas, you know, through some wires, some cabling into your instrument panel, right? So you'll have, usually, you'll have two VOR instruments, and these are, you know, circular dials. Uh, so and then you'll also have two nav radios. Usually most aircraft have two, right? So you'll have nav radio one and a VOR one, and then you'll have nav radio two, radio two and VOR two. So nav radio one is paired with VOR one. Nav radio two is paired with VOR two. So when you, so the, the radio is what, when, how you dial into the frequencies, right? To communicate whether just with the signals or actually communicate with the FSS station, uh, at that VOR, right? So, you know, when we talked about Oceanside being having the VOR frequency of 115.3, let's say we want that in on our VOR1 instrument. So on our NAV1 radio, we would dial in 115.3. Okay. And then on our VOR instrument, we would move the OBS dial, which we'll get into, and for the radio we want. And that would be picking up the signals on. 115.3 because it's connected to nav one okay and uh the vor station right as i mentioned it could be a vor vr dme vortac or tacan and uh you look for the symbols on your chart like we talked about and then to tune your vor right we talked about you know finding the frequency on the chart for that vor station dialing it into your nav radio and then you want to test the morse code as we talked about and then boom you are now connected once the test is good, the Morse code's good, you have frequency dialed into your nav radio, it's now connected, you're, you're now connecting and receiving the signals from that VOR. All right, so that is just kind of an overview of how the VOR nav 
ground-based navigation and your aircraft works in a complete system. I want to keep it at that kind of just the basics of understanding the system. And then we're going to get into how exactly the VOR works, how we find out which radial we're on, how we find out if we're off the radial, how we find out if we're to the left of a radial or the right of a radial, how we find out if we're on the to side or the from side, right? Once we can figure out the radial and the to from, we know the relative position from the station that we are. And then as we talked about, we can combine that with a DME or another VOR to find our exact location. So we'll get into that. We'll also get into like, what if we know that we want to fly along a route in our cross-country planning? Let's say we want to fly on, you know, the 090 radial to the east of, and we just want to fly along that from Oceanside VOR. Uh, and so all we have to do is intercept that radial and then f- keep keep everything centered on that radial on our VOR and fly along that 090 radio. We'll tell you how to do that as well. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you guys are having a great January. It feels like this month has been forever. And uh, yeah, so again, thanks for listening. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. If you haven't left us a review, we really appreciate it. Please do that. And if you want to come join us for those live lessons, we got one more this coming Wednesday. So depending on when you're listening to this, come join us. I think that's February 5th. We talked about that at the beginning of the episode. But all right, talk to you guys later.